Our reading today is Romans chapter 11, verse 33, to chapter 12, verse 8. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out! Who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his? God that God should repay him for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory for ever amen therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices holy and pleasing to God this is your spiritual act of worship do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Stella. Let's pray, shall we? Lord God, we thank you for your word of scripture and we pray that you would open it up to us today, that we may hear your voice speaking to our hearts. Amen. So as Nick mentioned, we're starting a new series today, um, What on Earth is the Church About? We're going to be exploring this over the course of about six weeks. Um, So I wonder, just to kick us off, if you want to perhaps turn to a neighbour or if you prefer just think to yourself, what is the answer to this question? What on earth is the church about? I'll just give you a couple of minutes to have a bit of a brainstorm, um, just to get your brains in gear. (laughs) Sorry, I didn't have the microphone on, but um, yeah, has any of you, do any of you want to say anything? What do you think the church is all about? I have got a few ideas myself, don't worry. (laughs) (laughs) We can do that if you like, I don't mind. (laughs) When I uh, started preparing this sermon, it reminded me of this uh, action rhyme that I used to do with my children when they were little, and I'm sure a lot of you know this. Um, It goes like this... uh, Here is the church, here is the steeple, open it up, and here are all the people. (laughs) My kids used to love it, and I used to quite like it as well. (laughs) But of course, that lovely little rhyme has something missing. What's missing? God, (laughs) exactly, yes. Uh, The rhyme captures two perspectives on church really well. It's a building, and like all the lovely buildings that Nick showed us earlier on, Um, I'll just take this out in case it's the, see if that's better. Yeah, okay. No. (laughs) Okay, I'll keep going. And it's a community of people, of course. Um, But it's very easy for us to forget sometimes whose church we are. Of course, we're the church of God. We're the body of Christ. And we are filled with and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So we might continue the rhyme. Here is our God. Here's Christ who is raised. Pour out your spirit 
that we may all be amazed. Because the fact is that there wouldn't be a church at all without God raising Jesus from the dead. And there wouldn't be a church at all without God pouring out his Holy Spirit at Pentecost. These are the things that brought the church into being. And so, although there's lots of things that could be said about the church and lots of things we're thankful for, the main thing, its whole reason for being, is a response to the marvellous, abundant mercies of God. And so as we think about uh, what the church is about over these next few weeks, we could start from the church as an institution, and we could say, well, what sort of characteristics and functions should such a church have? But a better starting point is probably to ask ourselves, how do we best respond to the mercy and grace of God? What would a right response be to the resurrection? What is the right response of us to, the, to Pentecost, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit? And then we should hopefully have a clearer picture of how the church came into being and how it should still be in being among us. And this is where Paul starts in that lovely passage that Stella read to us. He starts with an amazing hymn of praise to God. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. And he continues, for from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. <coughs> Amen. And so then having declared this wonderful praise to God, he continues, therefore, because of this praise, everything we owe to God, his glory, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercies, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. So in other words, he's saying this is our proper response to what God has already done, to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. So the very heart of what we're about as church is offering ourselves in love and in worship and in service in response to God's mercy and grace towards us. Now, I think we ought to pause here to acknowledge that this, this uh, vocabulary of sacrifice can feel a bit problematic for us. <coughs> Uh, offering a sacrifice sounds quite a negative thing to us, I think. It brings up pictures of somebody running themselves ragged, trying to do everything themselves, exhausting themselves in a life of service. But I don't think that's what Paul has in mind. Because when he, the reason that he uses this wording of sacrifice, he's using it metaphorically, playing on the terminology of worship of the time because in Paul's day as in many cultures throughout history animal sacrifice was at the center of patterns of worship and it was at the center of Jewish patterns of worship that's what the temple was essentially for really um, it was a place where priests <coughs> offered sacrifices of thanksgiving sacrifices of atonement sacrifice was an important element of worship not the rather distasteful thing we might think it uh, to be today. But of course, in the light of Christ's ultimate sacrifice on the cross, such sacrifices are no longer necessary. And the temple is no longer the central focus of our worship. Instead, it's the people in whom God's spirit lives following Pentecost who are now, metaphorically, the temple. And Paul says this in his writings elsewhere in 1 Corinthians. He writes, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives among you? And so in offering ourselves in worship and devotion to God, they are metaphorically the sacrifice. But of course, because it's a metaphor, they're a living sacrifice. 
On, um, on Friday, I went to see the film Oper Operation Mincemeat. I don't know if anyone's seen it here. No, it's, it's a World War film uh, set in World War II, based on a true event um, when the Allies deceived Hitler by planting fake documents on a corpse and uh, setting it adrift. Uh, you, you, do you know this, Stella? Um, so it looked like there was a British pilot who crash-landed with all these secret documents um, containing the Allies' um, uh, plans. And at one point in the film, a relative of the dead man appears um, unexpectedly. She doesn't know that he's died. She just knows that he's missing. And there's this rather funny scene when the British officers are trying to reassure her that um, her brother hasn't been in touch because he's been recruited to play an absolutely vital part in the war effort. And of course, the humour lies in the fact that the, the man was sad, is sadly dead. <laughs> so this vital role he's playing in the war effort is actually after his demise. He is, if you like, a dead sacrifice. But uh, that's not the case for us. We're a living sacrifice. We are not being used. We freely and intentionally offer ourselves to God in love and devotion in response to his grace. And while we live in and while we naturally belong to uh, an age which is dominated by sin, an age that uh, produces death, Christ gave himself to deliver us from that. And so if we belong to Christ, we've been brought into a new age of freedom and holiness and life that was ushered in at Christ's resurrection. And so because of that, Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We still live in this present age, which attempts to thwart the effects of that new age for us. And so, Paul says, as living sacrifices, we need to be intentional about living lives that aren't dictated by the patterns and powers that do not know Christ. But we need to be clinging to the resurrection life, the truth that we are loved by Christ, that we are redeemed by him, and that we're set free by him. That is our job as living sacrifices. Now you're probably wondering when I'm going to start talking about the church, given that's our theme. And in the second half of our reading, Paul does indeed go on to talk about the Romans as a church, and we're going to look at what he says in just a moment. But I think it's really important for us to grasp first that for Paul and for us, whatever kind of church we're part of, whatever that looks like, the starting point is always that we are responding to God's mercies. We are living lives that are lived freely in devotion to him. As Paul says, that's our true and proper worship. That's the starting point. So if we get that first, before we start looking at what we look like together, that will be helpful, I think. But of course, we don't live these transformed lives in isolation, do we? And actually, it's particularly in our relationships with one another that we see the transformation happen. It's no good, really, if I'm totally transformed and living a holy life all by myself. Together we do it. Together we are the body of Christ. And as Paul said in that verse I quoted earlier, you yourselves are God's temple and God's spirit lives among you, together. And so this is what he talks about when, uh, in verses 3 to 8. Only here he's not using the imagery of the temple anymore, he's using the imagery of a human body with different parts, different, with having different functions. He says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, are one, form one body, 
and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve, and so on, and so on, and so on. And it's a familiar image. He uses it elsewhere in his writings, in 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, and Colossians as well. But here, his point isn't really about all the different roles and functions that you might find in church. His point is more that no one of us should think of ourselves as being able to do it all by ourselves. We shouldn't think of ourselves as more important than other people because we all have different gifts and they're all to be used together as part of the body. Being practical is not one of my gifts. So in my uh, previous church, uh, one of my roles was uh, being the vicar's wife. And unfortunately, this role seemed to attach to itself various expectations, <laughs> one of which was that you're very good at acts of practical service. So the first Good Friday that we were there, it turned out that people expected to come back to the vicarage for hot cross buns after the morning service. So I vividly remember slipping away slightly early from, from church, coming back and desperately trying to toast hundreds of hot cross buns while making tea and coffee and trying to clear up the mess that was our house. And then the buns onto the grill burnt and the fire alarm went off and I was just balancing on a chair trying to take the battery out of the alarm. <laughs> when there was a knock on the door and this lovely lady called Joy came in who is one of the most practical and servant-hearted people I know. And she said, would you like some help? And I said, yes, please. <laughs> and right there, you have an example of the kind of thing Paul is talking about. <laughs> one member helping another and together uh, being the body of Christ. I'm very grateful for the gifts that God has given me. And I'm trying my best to grow in them in response to God's mercy and for the benefit of the church, by which I don't mean an abstract institution, I mean you and the people up the road at St. Tim's and whoever else God turns out to call me to. But I'm even more grateful to be part of a church where there are people who have the gifts that I don't have. It's wonderful, especially those who are good at mass catering. You know who you are. <laughs> and of course, we have to acknowledge that there are places where this lovely model breaks down. As I said earlier, we live in a world and an age which doesn't know Christ. And flawed as we all are, we sometimes live in the light of that world, not in the light of Christ's resurrection and the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. And this can affect the body of Christ too on earth. So in its practical outworking, we are sometimes a bit dysfunctional, perhaps even abusive. But this doesn't mean that we give up on the church. The church that exists, remember, in response to God's mercy, in response to Christ's resurrection, in response to the Holy Spirit. And it's presumably because the, uh, the Roman churches were less than perfect that Paul writes to them like this, encouraging them that they are the body of Christ, encouraging them to intentionally offer themselves as living sacrifices, keep living uh, in a way that's been transformed by the new age and the light of Christ's resurrection. So for some of us, um, living like we are the body of Christ, a living sacrifice, will mean thinking that we're not more important than others, if that's our temptation. It's not up to any of us alone. For others of us, it might be that you are still waiting to discover God's gifting for you. Or perhaps you haven't yet plucked up courage to walk in the light of that gifting. God can surprise us, and I think 
whatever we think we are now, God may have more gifts in store for all of us. I know that to be true in my own life. I could never have imagined going into church leadership, I think I've said before, a few years ago. Let's pray, shall we, as we respond to what Paul has said to us. Lord God, we thank you for your church. We thank you that we have the opportunity together to respond to the amazing mercies that you have poured out for us. The resurrection of your son, the new life that we have, the pouring out of your spirit, the great bliss of knowing your love in our hearts and knowing that you gift us, that you call us, each one of us, to play our part in being your body here on earth. Lord, where we think that we can do it all, where we perhaps are guilty of making the church depend upon us, making ourselves too vital, we pray that you would give us an appreciation of others and of all the gifts that they bring. And we pray that you would turn our hearts again in worship and devotion to you, that we may know that we are only here because of you, only here to worship you. <coughs> and we pray, Lord, where we're thinking, I have nothing to offer, or I don't know if I can. Lord, bring your spirit. We pray, Lord, that you would move amongst us all, that you would bring your gifts, that you would raise us up and show us how we are blessed by you and can offer what we have to you. Lord, help us to offer ourselves as joyous living sacrifices, devoted to you in worship, longing to know more of you, to live more in your love, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And protect us, Lord, from all the powers of darkness that would seek to drag us away from our vocation as your children. Lord, may your kingdom come in this place and may your kingdom come in us and through us now and always. Amen.